it's my great pleasure to introduce three speakers uh, for the second session. Armin Grünbacher starts uh, by talking about uh, KFW and the years in which the, organ the institution was created uh, after the Second World War. Then after that, Zeliha uh, Zaya, I hope I pronounce her name correctly, uh, talking about public banks in uh, Turkey, and Ilaria Pasotti uh, talking about IMI or IMI, uh, an Italian development bank, uh, state owned development bank, with a very interesting paper. Uh, I'm going to be very rude in terms of timekeeping, uh, but please excuse me for that. And we just straight away go to Armin to start. It's your turn, please. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Politics of Pragmatism, the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau as a bridge between a state and private banks and businesses during the West German reconstruction period. To answer that question that came earlier, should Ireland have a state bank? Based on the model uh, of the Kreditanstalt, I would definitely, definitely say yes. State banks are nothing new in Germany, but the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, the KFW, stands out. Before the KFW, there had been things like the Preußische Seehandelsgesellschaft, and then in particular in the Weimar period, the Reichskreditgesellschaft. The KFW is different. I'm trying to make five points here in this paper that first one is that although the KFW has been called a German institution, it is actually set up, organized, initiated by the Allies. It is the supervisory board in its early years uh, that is very important for the corporation's work and that makes it stand out as a good example of the what Abelshauser termed the corporate state. Points three and four overlap, and these are the crucial points for the politics of pragmatism. It is the person and the role of Hermann Josef Abs within the bank, number three, and within the wider economy and society, number four, that makes um, the KFW probably more effective. And then finally, I'll argue that the KFW is a state bank, but it is not state controlled. The, allied, uh, the KFW as an allied creation. Um, al although Andrew Schoenfeld has coined the phrase a characteristic German institution, it is the bank is not the brainchild of Hermann Josef Abs, as um, claimed by Abs, and then um, the claim further spread by Manfred Pohl's book, we, uh, Wiederaufbau. We come on details on, on that a little bit later. A matter of fact, the KFW is a result of British and American disputes over banking policies during the 90, period 1947-1948. It is the British who try to have some form of centralized banking system in order to finance the reconstruction of the Ruhr, because back home in Britain, there is no money to pay for the occupation of Germany. The Americans, on the other hand, wanted to have um, a decentralized system. What is very interesting is that during the gestation process, that is July 1947, when the British make the first proposal for a corporation for reconstruction loan, and June 1948, when the Biparty Control Office, BICO, issues the principles for a reconstruction loan corporation, um, once that happens, the gestation process is taken over by the Germans. In contrast to the print principles uh, outlined by the Allies, the Germans claim supervision of the bank. They increase the supervisory board membership from sub, uh, eight that had been suggested by the Allies to 20. And as a means of funding for the bank, they suggest that uh, 
counterpart, Marshall Plan counterpart funds should be uh, utilized as well. Matter of fact, the counterpart funds will become the largest section of funding up to the late 1950s. This in itself shows that John Gimbel is absolutely right with his claim, or this is another proof of Gimbel's claim, that allied actions in 1948 cannot happen against German resistance. The more the allies want to build up a German state, the more they have to rely on German cooperation. The makeup and the significance of the Verwaltungsrat is quite uh, an interesting point. The Verwaltungsrat, the supervisory body, is made up first and foremost of the chairman and the deputy chairman who were appointed by the Bisonal Executive Council, the Verwaltungsrat des Vereinigten Wirtschaftsgebietes, after the creation of the Federal Republic by the federal government. It, membership consists of equal numbers, first three, then after the creation of the Federal Republic of four members from the central government, plus the equal members from the land representatives. There are four members from the banking sector covering different sectors of a banking sector, plus uh, ex officio, a member of the Bank Deutsche Länder, the central bank. There is, of course, one representative from agriculture, and there are three representatives from different sectors of industry, and also quite interestingly, to match those industrial representatives, there are three trade union representatives on the board. In contrast to what Thielmann Pünder has said in his, uh, implied in his book, Das Bizonale in der Regium, there are actually very fierce ideological battles over the board membership, in particular in regard to the representative of the housing industry. Should it be somebody from the private housing association or from uh, nonprofit organizations? This brings us now to the person of Hermann Josef Abs. Without a doubt, Abs is the central figure within the KFW's first 20 years of operation. Since 1945, out of office at Deutsche Bank, he is the unofficial advisor to the British military government, and he is also the unofficial advisor to German industry. His reputation by 1947 uh, is such that he is visited by um, Richard Whitehead, the President Truman's special representative on German reconstruction. And Abs become gets involved in German response to the Allied principles on for the uh, RLC, and he gets all the most likely. Um, evolved in the drafting of the KFW bill, uh, in particular, um, the use of counterpart funds utilities. Apps, however, in his position of helping to draw up the um, law, makes also sure that the KFW will not become a competitor to private banks in the same way as the Reichskreditgesellschaft had been in the 1920s and 1930s. Apps had been rejected in April 1948 for the um, uh, presidency of the directorate of the Bank Deutsche Länder. Usually the claim is that he did not take the post because uh, some important demands he had were rejected by the Allies. I think this claim is not, cannot be substantiated. There are doc, uh, um, there's documentary evidence in the archive of the Bundesbank that um, where the American, Americans had explained to a uh, Bundesbank uh, Bank Deutsche Länder uh, board member that apps will be rejected for political reasons. The French apparently didn't like him. Mm -hmm. 
What is interesting and shows up his influence as well is that he is nominated, although on the supervisory board, he is nominated into the Vorstand, the executive board. And even more interesting is that although the law stipulates that if this happens, uh, he should seize uh, the activities on the supervisory board. He doesn't. Apps remains um, on a member of six standing committees, supervisory board standing committees, uh, usually as chairman or at least deputy chairman. Apps then provide uh, is crucial in providing KFW loans to companies without proper securities. On the one hand, there are the coal mines. This is very obvious. The coal mines had been expropriated. Uh, but it's more interesting in the case of uh, Carl Zeiss Optical Company, which at the time had been just relocated to the rural backwaters of uh, Württemberg, where they still are today, thriving. It is only when Apps provides some less than 5 billion uh, marks of loan via the KFW to size that other local banks come forward and provides further loans. So here Apps is crucial, KFW becomes crucial for confidence building. It's very interesting to, to, to note also that between 1949 and 1950, half of the loans given by the KFW are given as direct loans. Apps is also the one who pushes the importance of export finance, that credits is given to exporting companies um, so uh, to cover their, their cash flow until the payments are made. This is, has to be seen in the context of the balance of payment crisis uh, the Federal Republic is in, in 1949, 1950, 1951. And in this way, as the KFW says, they are going to close, quote, a gap in the national economy, eine volkswirtschaftliche Lücke schließen. The uh, export credits by 1951 amount to some uh, 700, more than 700 million. As soon as uh, the crisis is over, these loans, 600 million of those loans, are handed over to the newly created Ausfuhr Kreditanstalt, a consortium of private banks. So here is a sign may, that. May I remind you of the time, please? Yeah. Um, apps outside uh, po post and, con and positions are also important. He is a member of Adenauer's Kitchen Cabinet. He holds about 20 supervisory board memberships, usually chairmanships uh, at deputy chairmanships. And most prominently, he is the head of the German London Debt Conference in 1953. So he has, and he is the central figure for the reforming of the Deutsche Bank. So he has his fingers in every pie. This means he has the influence to uh, convince the banking community to get a guarantee for the KFW's first bond issue in 1949, which is a disaster, quite frankly. Of the 50 million bonds sold, 28 million have to be taken up by the banking consortium. APS is, in Gal Lothar Gall's words, the sp uh, spokesman of Deutschland AG in the 1950s and the 1960s. In 1993, Forbes called him, that's a year before the man dies, the most powerful man in Germany by some distance. The KFW is a state bank, but not controlled by the state. By the state. In the case, this is most prominent by, in the case of politically motivated loans to Yugoslavia in the early 1950s. These are export loans, when the other export loans are handed back to the AK, 126 million loans to Yugoslavia are stay with the Kreditanstalt because they are just dodgy loans. There's a high risk that they will default. When the KFW then in 1952 is asked 
not asked, told by the government to increase those loans by a third, uh, further 38 million, of which the KFW has to provide another eight millions of their own. The reaction is just furious. And on perhaps stipulation, they write to the uh, ministries in Wolf and said, this time we play along. If you ever do this again, we will publicly reject your claim. This sets the boundaries. The KFW is its own master. The opposite also applies that with the case of Klaus Don, managing director since 1954, he has to re more or less uh, resign in 1960 because he went on too many, um, in particular, uh, uh, export development funding projects on his own without having them organized, uh, agreed by the ministries. When he resigns, there is outright delight in the economics ministry. In summary, the KFW is not dissolved in the mid 1950s, which could have signified the completion of the reconstruction process. Instead, it continues its operation in areas of national economic importance or political influence. Um, export loans to India in 1957 come to mind. Mittelstandsförderung, funding for small and medium-sized enterprise in the late 50s, and so on. This is done all without interfering within the business of traditional banks. And it is done by applying the blueprint APS has created. As the KFW wrote in uh, uh, an obituary in the year he died, er schuf die Kreditanstalt nach seinen Vorstellungen. He created the KFW according to his ideas. This makes the KFW a government tool in the reconstruction process and way beyond up to the present day. Development aid, we will hear about this later on, is one task, but it is not the only one. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting paper and a very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to invite questions, if I can see them. Uh, hopefully, Jan Kranen has a question. Jan, I it's your turn. <laughs> so one question to Armin Grünbacher. Um, is, you said they, are, they play a special role because of UPS vision, let's say, but what made UPS ideas last? Could you trail trace down the, let's say, the constitutional or institutional features that made this special uh, uh, functioning survive even his own time and his own influence? Um, I think the way the KFW operated, in particular in the 1950s, when late 1950s, it's called the Wirtschaftsliche, uh, Wirtschaftspolitische Feuerwehr des Bundes. The, economic policy fire brigade of the federal government. But that's not independence. Um, it is independent that, um, yes, there are federal ministers on the board, on the supervisory board, who can steer into certain directions. But the government itself cannot just order them, cannot order the bank to do certain things. If the bank does not want to do it, they don't have to do it. If the majority of the supervisory board would agree to not doing it. Um, but to give you an, an, another example where they worked very closely with the federal government, 1988, there's a big development aid project funded by the KFW which, for, for Jordan, which turned out to be tornado fighter jets. Once this leaks to the public, the project has to be withdrawn. In this case, it shows the KFW had been briefed, the KFW by the government, the KFW is prepared to do the funding. Mm -hmm. the, the Yugoslavia case showed we are not prepared to do everything. We need at least to be consulted. If you consult us, we go along with it. Otherwise we won't. The, the model, um, when, you, when you look at the activities of the KFW from reconstruction uh, uh, of housing, of industry, of land cultivation, um, Flurbereinigung in Germany is partly paid. 
Mittelstandsförderung, Loans to small and medium-sized businesses, um, eventually uh, development aid. Since the 1980s, late 1980s, uh, investment in um, environmental protection. Large parts of the cost of, of uh, reunification had been covered by, by the uh, finance by the KFW. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the withdrawal of Russian uh, troops from the GDR, the building of the houses for them in, the, in uh, Russia, Soviet Union, had been financed. So there is a perfect tool that is not in the public view. It's absolutely brilliant for political reasons. You can finance projects that are important economically or politically without having going to the public market and having to face difficult, potentially difficult questions from private banks and their shareholders. Okay. Sorry, long answer. No, it's a long answer, but it's a very important question because of course your presentation raises the interest in um, whether the specific structure that uh, Hermann Josef Apps seems to have introduced uh, and shaped, whether this has uh, remained until today. And it's very interesting what you say about the early years and also with this remark more about the later years, because it casts a rather positive light on the public bank. And we're going to see much more of the same in the two following presentations by Celia uh, and Ilaria. Uh, and I switch over and thank you very much, Ami. Thank you. And let us now turn to Ilaria Pasotti, uh, who is uh, an in-house historian in Intesa San Paolo Group. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here on this panel. And you talk, please, about uh, Instituto Mobiliare Italiano. Here we are with the presentation. So yeah. the, um, the paper deals with the role played by the Instituto Mobiliare Italiano as an instrument uh, for the same intervention in the Italian economy. In particular, we focus uh, on the two decades after the post-World War II, when the Institute was a privileged interlocutor in the provision of the subsidized credit, which was the main instrument of economic policy to support industry. The criticism arise against uh, this instrument pointed out the negative effect on the ability of credit institutions to select companies and investment projects. With particular reference to the EME, scholars have argued that its broad involvement with this policy led to its crisis at the end of the 1970s. Without disputing this, uh, the validity of this argument, it may be recognized, however, that the Institute, as a public credit institution, tried to combine the support to industry within the framework of the government policy with the application of rigorous criteria in assessing the credit worthiness of industrial initiatives. After a brief outline of the institutional model, I trace the evolution of the institute activity, and then I illustrate a case study of EMI lending that demonstrates how the institute interpreted the objectives of economic policy with the rigorous assessment of credit worthiness. The EMI has its uh, origin in the intervention of the state to take the, the 1929 crisis, which had affected the largest industrial groups, as well as the major Italian universal banks. It was the first step towards an overall reform of the banking system, which was completed in 1936 and was based on the separation between the bank and the industry on the one hand, and on the functional and operational specialization of intermediaries on the other. The IMI was assigned the task to facilitate the bank disinvestment while trying to ensure more adequate forms of financing for the functioning and development of industry. It was shaped according to a project by Alberto Beneduce, an economist and politician who had already designed the first Institute for Industrial Credit in the 1910s and 20s. As the other Beneduce Institute, the IMI was an institution of public law, therefore the weight of government entities was predominant in both the ownership structure and the composition of the management bodies. 
Moreover, while it was preventing from collecting deposit, it was entitled to fund its provision by issuing bonds that carry special privilege, for instance, state guarantee. Uh, however, the IMI different from uh, the Beneduce Institute at it was entrusted with not only granting loans, but also underwriting equity in companies. In 1936, uh, IMI's role was strengthened with respect to other industrial credit institutions. The maximum duration of the loans was extended from 10 to 20 years. It could, it could also establish branches. Moreover, the Consorzio per le Sovvenzioni di uh, Valori Industriali, that was the first Italian industrial credit institution created in 1930 to support the industry during the war, became an autonomous section of IMI. Finally, the governor of the Bank of Italy was also appointed chairman of the institute. The autonomy from the top manager of the Bank of Italy was restored uh, shortly after the end of the World War II. However, since then, a strong connection with the central bank was preserved in practice. The general director of the Bank of Italy was appointed as deputy chairman of the IMI. In 1936, uh, two relevant innovations for the governance were adopted. The chairman's mandate was without time limit. Moreover, the members of the management body appointed by the government increased in number compared to those appointed by the shareholdings. In the following two decades, the Institute came to pursue a different vision of public interest that was finally formulated in the statute of 1962. The mission of the IMI was to contribute to the, development, to the development and strengthening of the Italian economy by carrying out credit and financial operation in general. Consequently, all the limitation of duration and form of funding we are overcome and to a large extent in those of funding its provision with only the exception of collecting deposits. As well as, as well as all nationalistic distinction fell as regard to currency, no longer only the Italian lira, the territorial area no longer restricted to that of Italian sovereignty and the beneficiaries no longer limited to companies of Italian nationality. Even if the IMI uh, was conceived by the government uh, authority at the center of the industrial credit system until the post-World War II, it was far from achieving the goals that we are assigned to it. Under the first chairman, Theodoro Mayer, IMI followed a very prudential lending policy. The acquisition of shareholding was excluded, as well as a rescue operation of the companies with financial relations with the banks in crisis. It was given priority to debt restructuring loans against those supporting new investment. The displacement effects suffered by two entities, the Sezione Finanziamenti Industriali, the House Bank of the, uh, the IRI, the entity that was created in 1934 to took over the control of the major universal banks and the Consorzio per le Sovvenzioni dei Valori Industriali also contributed uh, to its limited activity in these early years. The chairmanship of Vincenzo Alzolini restricted the institute operational autonomy and held back its uh, uh, territorial decentralization. However, it was beneficial on the side of the funding its provision as the IMI was given a priority in issuing bonds, authorization, and in the placement of bonds. Even without reaching a pivotal uh, position in the industrial credit system between the mid-1930s and the first half of the 1940s, the share of the IMI progressively increased on the consistency of loans granted by the system passing from 7% in 1936 to 32.5% in 1945. The loans with financial purposes gradually gave way uh, to those supporting the demand for industrial investment connected to the auto key and the warmongering policy. It was also entrusted with uh, ship financing. 
starting from the second post World War II, the IMI and the, the dynamic chairmanship of Stefano Silienti was able to hold a prominent position in the industrial credit system. Firstly, it played a key role in Italy's recovery, being entrusted exclusively by the government with the management of special funds and international loans, such as the Exim Bank loans in 1947 and the European Recovery Program loans. Then, when the economic recovery was achieved, the uh, IMI became the major instrument of government policy of favorable credit terms in three main fields export credit, the promotion of the industrialization of the Mezzogiorno, and also the improvement of technological innovation in industry. Starting from the mid 1960s, uh, uh, while recording uh, the shrinking expansion of subsidy side credit, especially in the South, and for particular categories uh, of industry, such as the petrochemical, in uh, its annual reports, the Institute drew the attention of the authorities to the concern that they could turn into welfare credits. The Institute remarked that to avoid negative spillovers, two criteria should be rigorously assessed. The economic validity of the project by taking into account the dimensional, technological, organizational, financial, and income implication that the growing competition in the integrated market imposes to the company, and the patrimonial and financial solidity of the borrowing company. In particular, on the basis of its experience, it also su suggested the opportunity of a more correct proportion between own means and credit means in order to have a greater guarantee on the sound uh, company management and the ability of the company to overcome the adverse phases of an economic uh, situation. The case study of um, uh, the loans granted to Pignone demonstrated um, in his adherence to this criteria while acknowledging the exceptional situation in which the application uh, we are made. Uh, for example, we, may, uh, we mentioned uh, one of these uh, uh, loan applications um, that was made as part of the management entrusted exclusively to me to support the conversion and the reconstruction of the industry in 1936. Pignone was among uh, the companies that had heavy uh, difficulties in restructuring its production from war to peace purposes. During the World War II, Pignone had strongly expanded its activity in military supplies. Moreover, in the final years of the conflict, it was took over by Esnia Viscosa, an important industrial group specialized in the production of the artificial textile fibers. Uh, who aim to place the mechanical uh, production of the company at its service. Uh, the company applied for uh, uh, 106 million of lire to meet uh, an adequate supply of raw materials in the absence of which uh, um, all forecast of 1946 production could fail, putting the company uh, in the painful need to close uh, uh, various plants. The forecast provided by the company highlighted in addition to the scarcity of financial resources to cope with the, uh, the need uh, provision, also the problem of keeping the excess of manpower employed in an unproductive sectors. The trade union also wrote um, to the IMIS chairman to support uh, the company's law application. While acknowledging the uncertainty about the profitability and the difficulty of filing, the IMIS inspector noted that the company was in an effective productive phase and it seems to head towards a full settlement. With regard to the prospect, then it was remarked that the company could take advantage of both its technical experience in production in which it was competitive and Desnia Viscosa's uh, trading network for the export of its new production, the textile machinery. Uh, 
It was precisely on the role of Snea Viscosa that the inspector insisted the parent company should have reserved all or most of the mechanical work to the Pignone and at the same time should have to intervene with its own capital to smooth out the financial difficulties of the company. Hence, the decision of the IMI to grant a credit of 70 million with two provisions, a recapitalization carried out by Snea Viscosa and the reorganization of the production process by moving workforce from less to more to efficient um, sectors. Um, in conclusion, um, IMI was a public credit institution that was at the service of the government policy, policy to support industry. It started to play this role from the mid-1930s with the autarkic and the warmongering policy. Yet it assumed assume a prominent position against the other industrial credit institution in the post-World War II, when firstly it was entrusted with the special management of a fund for reconstruction, and then uh, when became greatly involved in the government policy of subsidized credit in the 1950s and 1960s. Very critical on the development of the government policy of subsidized credit the IMI managed this credit by applying rigorous criteria in the assessment of loan application, subordinating the lending to conditions that affected the organizational structure and management choices of the company, especially when the outstanding debt were excessive or social purposes of the loan prevailed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank all those who made presentations. Thank all those who will who are still there and uh, wish you a good break. And we'll see each other again at two o'clock when Jan Kran takes over the moderation. Thank you, uh, Zeliha. Uh, thank you, Ilaria. Thank you, Armin. Thank you, Rainer, and all the others. Uh, and Oscar, uh, it's good to see you.